Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and this morning we're going to finish the epistle looking at verses 19 through to verse 24. Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 19 to verse 24. And please follow the reading with one of the pew Bibles if, if you don't have one with you. Um, there should be pew Bibles uh, available somewhere around. Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 19. If you're not sure where Ephesians is, there's no shame looking up the index. That's what it's printed for. You'll find it in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19. Where Paul writes, Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. And may God help us to understand his word. So we turn to these closing verses of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We have learned a tremendous amount through this epistle. We've been shown a tremendous view of the love, the grace of God, the purpose of God, which stretches from before the creation of the world, away ahead into all eternity. We've seen something of just how much God has done for us through Jesus Christ. We've seen something of that change which God himself and only God can make within the human heart. We've seen challenging verses about how we should conduct ourselves in church and at home, wives and husbands, with our children, with our parents, at work. We've been encouraged to take up this full armor of God so that we might stand firm on that gospel ground, that salvation ground that has been won for us by Christ. Now, as the letter draws to a close, Paul turns to more personal words. And our attention is turned from the armor that we were thinking about last week onto Paul himself. And as we look at these closing verses, then we begin to see something of the stature of the man who has written this epistle. We see something of the stature of a man who has really given his whole life to God. We see something of what authentic Christianity looks like in practice from Paul himself. And I want really to think about two aspects of Paul's faith and his life that emerge from these closing verses. The first is his complete dedication to Christ's service, his complete dedication to Christ's service. And then I want us to look also at his concern for this church in Ephesus that he has been writing to. Paul's dedication... Look at what he requests when he asks for the people in Ephesus to pray for him. Remember, he is in prison. Uh, He is chained. There will be a Roman guard nearby. He is deprived uh, all the liberties which previously he had enjoyed. There is a huge question mark over his life. But look at what he prays. He doesn't pray... Or he doesn't say to the Ephesians, pray also for me that these chains might be taken from me. He doesn't say, pray also for me that I might be let out of prison and that this Roman guard might vanish. He doesn't say, pray for me that I might be made free and enjoy again all those liberties that I once had. Look at what he does say. He says, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador 
in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. Paul makes a little play on words, you see. When he says, an ambassador in chains, uh, he's using a phrase which would refer to the kind of chains that would be worn by an ambassador or by some high official that would denote his office. Think of, of, of our own provost when he goes to some official function uh, as the provost of Dundee, then he's got the chain round him and the, the, the stone. And that's the kind of chain that Paul describes when he says an ambassador in chains. And in the world that Paul lived in, those chains were a mark of honor and of rank and of wealth. What Paul is saying, and this is the staggering thing, is that my chains, these manacles and the chains that held them to the wall, my chains that deprived him of his liberty and his freedom, my chains which we would think on the surface would spell dishonor and lowliness and poverty, my chains, he says, are my honor. My chains are my rank. My chains are my wealth. It is everything to me, he's saying. It is an honor to me. It is my wealth to be a prisoner for Christ. If I'm this for him, then because he is so important to me, then I am glad and I am honored and I count myself rich to be in this condition for him. You see, he is completely dedicated to this Christ and to his service. So that even the opportunities that he has to speak in prison to his jailer, to the guards, to those others who would come and see him, even those opportunities he wants to take to be able not to complain about his circumstances to them, not to beef on at them, not to plead for his liberty, not anything except to make known the mystery of the gospel, to tell these people about the Savior for whom he is an ambassador in chains, to pass on to them the good news of God's love for them. He is completely taken up, completely dedicated, not with church, not with some human institution, not with some program of events, but with Christ himself. Completely dedicated to him. Now it was costly and uncomfortable for Paul to live for Christ, but it was his greatest blessing what about you and me? There is so much in the world and so much in our own backgrounds and maybe there is enough within us to encourage us to dodge discomfort, to encourage us to become, if you like, Christian chameleons. We evade embarrassment. We merge in with the background, with everybody else. Don't let me be seen to be in any way different. Let me be anonymous. Let me, let me be hidden. Don't let anyone know I'm a Christian. And like chameleons, we just take on the color of what's going on around us. And we don't stand out as being Christ's. We want a cost-free Christianity, and there is so much which persuades us that Christianity should be cost-free. It's supposed to be about peace. It's supposed to be about getting everything from God. It's supposed to be about getting all your prayers answered. It's supposed to be about happiness. It's supposed to be about joy, isn't it? Well, yes, but it's not cost-free. Paul knew the price. He was paying the price. He was dictating a letter to someone who was writing down because he couldn't, because he was chained up with a question mark over his future. How about you and me? What about courageous declaration of the gospel? What about the costly discipleship that Christ demands? What about authentic Christianity? Look at where the Savior trod. We were singing with the children uh, these words about Jesus, I will walk, come with you, I will follow in your way. 
Look at the way he went. He was despised and rejected. He had nowhere to lay his head. In the end, he was crucified. He was rejected even by those who had followed him, who ended up shouting, crucify him. Following Christ will never be cost free. But it is the only way to glory. The only way. Pray for me, he says, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. But Paul is not so sort of taken up with Christ that he forgets other people. In fact, because he's taken up with Christ, he does think of other people. We sometimes have this, this picture, this caricature of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a committed Christian. We have this caricature that maybe comes from, from American TV or something like that. We're not too sure where it comes from. Or from, from the remarks made by some people um, within even the Church of Scotland. But we have this caricature of somebody who becomes a Christian, somebody who, if you like, is, is born again as being some, some sort of freak and they're a bit wacky. And uh, they've, they've sort of slipped anchor from normal life and there's something rattling loose inside their heads and they're not really connected with everybody else. But Paul shows that, in fact, the opposite is true. The more we are taken up with Christ, the more that he becomes number one in our lives, then the more concerned we are for other people, the more real are our relationships with other people. And so having asked these Ephesian Christians to pray for him, and that prayer that we've looked at, he turns to them. And we see something of his concern for this congregation. The congregation in Ephesus was very, very dear to him. When he met with the elders from the church in Ephesus whilst he was being taken off to prison in Rome, he met with them, he knew it was going to be the last time, and he wept with them because they meant so much to him. And here we see some of that concern coming to the surface again. Not concern for Paul, but for them. It shows in two ways. First of all, he's going to send somebody, Tychicus. And Tychicus was going to do two things which expressed Paul's concern. The first was that he was going to convey news of how Paul was getting on in prison. Because he knows that these people in Ephesus will be worried about him in a sense. They'll be anxious. They'll be wanting to know. They'll be wanting to pray. They'll be wanting to know how their friend, how the one who brought the gospel to them is getting on. And so he sends Tychicus to tell them to keep in touch, to give them the news, to give them the points for their prayers, to keep the communication open. And he wants Tychicus also to encourage them. That is, literally, he wants them to be filled with courage. He wants them to take heart. He knows that they're in a fight. That's why he's written the armor passage that we were looking at the past three weeks. He knows that they face temptations, sometimes very fierce, sometimes they're going drip, drip, drip. And it's not a very hard and fierce battle, it's a slow war of attrition that the enemy is waging on their souls to bring them down. He knows that in their homes and in their church they need God's guidance to live a godly life. And so he wants them to be encouraged. He doesn't want to write to them and tell them all about their faults and pull them down. He wants them to be encouraged. He wants them to have metal. He wants them to have that, that simple, brave approach to the Christian life, which says, well, no matter what, God is with me, and so I'm going to stand firm, and I'm going to stay close to Him. He knows that they're prone to discouragements, aren't we? Isn't it so easy for us to grow disheartened, to be discouraged for things that people say or don't say, for things that people do or don't do, for our circumstances or events or something that we take all the wrong way just to bring us down and our hearts sink. And we begin to interpret things one way or another and we get into a right old stew and before we know where we are, we are collapsing inwardly. 
Now, that's a very real human condition, and Christians are afflicted with that as much as anybody else, maybe more so, and Paul knows that, and so he writes, and he sends Tychicus, so that these Christians might be encouraged. Go on, he's saying, keep on in this Christian faith. Don't let yourself get knocked sideways, knocked off your ground. Go on in the faith. Be of good courage. Press on. So he sends Tychicus. But he does something else which expresses his concern, and we see it just in the last two verses there. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. He's praying for them, you see. There he is, astonishing, isn't it? There he is in prison with his own needs desperately obvious and he's really concerned about them and he's praying for them, this benediction. He's calling down these blessings from God upon them. And these are things that we've been reading about all the way through the letter. Things which Paul has been expressing and talking about in one way or another in so many different verses. Peace. As we've read through this letter, we've seen that Jesus is our peace. His death and resurrection are the grounds for our peace, our peace with God, our peace with one another, our peace within our own souls. Jesus makes peace. He makes peace between God's people and between them and God himself. Jesus reconciles us to God with whom we were once at enmity. God, whom we once, in a sense, were striving against as we wanted our own way. Jesus makes peace. Jesus preaches peace. Jesus creates and the Spirit applies a bond of peace which we are urged to maintain within a congregation. We stand firm with those good gripping boots of peace, of gospel peace proclaimed by the gospel. Peace was part of the opening of Paul's letter. Peace from God. Peace with God. Peace with one another. Peace within. And love, which goes along with faith, added to the faith that they already have. For he's already written that we are dearly loved children, loved by God, so that we can love him and love one another. Has it ever struck you that God is filled, as it were, with kindness towards you? That his love expresses itself towards you in the way that he understands you, in the way that he enters, as it were, your house on errands of kindness to encourage you when you're feeling low, to inform you when you need to know the way ahead, to forgive you when you know you've sinned. Our God is a God of love, a God who loves each of us. And so easily we can begin to view him like the great divine celestial head teacher, just wanting to pull us into his study and whack us because we've been naughty and broken some rule or another. And we can even begin to view the Christian life as some great list of do's and don'ts and we come to church each week feeling mostly guilty about the things that we haven't done that were mentioned last week. And we forget that our God is a God of love, first and foremost, first and last, who loves his people. And then the grace that love which is, in a sense, a very special kind of love. It's a love which we have deserved the very opposite of. It's a love which is the first principal blessing of the Christian life. It's the grace which gave Paul the gift of preaching. It's the grace which Paul has preached. It is the grace, as we were reading in chapter 2, in the first ten verses there, it is the grace which has saved us. A covenant love of God by which he binds sinners to himself. 
That's the note on which he ends. It's the note on which he began. It's the note that sounded all the way through. It's the note on which he ends. The grace of God which saves. Do you know that grace? Do you know it in your own life? Is it the mainspring of your life? Is it the grace of God which has changed you? Is it the grace of God which inspires you when you're feeling so low about yourself or about your circumstances? Is it the grace of God which when the devil comes and tells you that you're not good enough and he's absolutely right, and when he reminds you of those sins that you committed and he tells you that you're never ever going to be worthy of this kind of God, you're never going to be able to call yourself a Christian, is it the grace of God that silences those accusations that silences those lies and those half-truths, that silences even the pointed sharp truth that we do not deserve. The grace of God which tells us that we don't need to because He simply loves us and has already sent His Son to do all that was needed. The grace of God, he says. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. That grace hasn't entered your life, but you know that it needs to. Then don't put off the day. Even this day, even now, ask God for that grace and he will give it. Amen.